must be our goal and our guide. And all that we strive for as a human family, dignity and hope, progress and prosperity, depends on peace. But peace depends on us. Thank you very much, God, for bringing us here this morning. Thank you very much, God, on behalf of Africa and the world. Thank you very much for keeping us alive. We are in your hands, God. Do we pray to you that we continue to see light out of this pandemic that is sweeping the world Thank you, O oh God, for preparing us to be able to have this first conference on the African soil regarding before, pre, and post, pre, during, and post pandemic conference. Thank you, O oh God, that we shall, whatever we deliver, or deliberate from here will be taken up by African countries in preparation for the pandemic whose time lifeline we don't know, in preparation for the economic hardships that will come and continue coming on a daily basis because of the pandemic we pray for those struggling for peace across Africa. We pray for all those in conflict resolution who need conflict resolution mechanisms to be brought to their countries. We pray for Namudi Khan that wherever he is, he gets a fair hearing and let the world know about his abductors, those who seduced him to be abducted, and they don't want to tell us how they abducted him. They are against international laws. We pray, God, that this does not work well when we are putting the world in order, that anyone picks your plane and diverts it to a place, as a person who has suffered this type of harassment before, attempted murder, attempted assassinations, I feel so hard this morning. But God, all my heart and the hearts of those who yearn for that freedom are in your hands, that we pray tomorrow and the other day that as this pandemic sweeps Africa, let there be a solution. African countries have not been prepared. They will never be prepared. They have never even been prepared. The money you send, they eat it. The Buharis of these days eat the money and allow people, they fly out in hospitals across the globe to be treated while the people in Africa suffer. We pray that you give courage. Oh God, remove this burden from us. Most of us cannot afford oxygen. Most of us cannot afford the tablets. Most of us cannot even afford masks. The continent was not prepared. The continent is not prepared. The continent will not be prepared. But what can we do as Africans? We pray for you as we start this conference. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. My father, in 1974, when I finished, I finished senior four. 
Senior 4, 1974. I passed religious education very well, which is called, by then it was called RK, religious, religious knowledge. Don't mind about my accent because for us, where I come from, they call TD and the DT. So at times I might slip the tongue and I call T a D. My father wanted me to become a bishop, a reverend. In 1974, after senior four, where I passed religious knowledge with a distinction number two, that means I knew the Bible so well. This Bible here, which I have had for 45 years. I knew it very well. So my father had an impression that you must go to Bishop Taka College Mukono. It's now a university to study theology. My seven uncles, one of them was very upset and told my father, how do you take this guy to this thing here called religion? He will become very deadly and we, he will lose one item. This guy is a politician. He should go back and study and continue with A levels. So my, my uncle at night came and stole me or stole the whole the property, the, the, the bed sheets, everything, put in a suitcase, said, let's go. And took me back to Kampala and took me to Uganda College of Commerce to study business studies. Another uncle came and took me away from Uganda College of Commerce. This is during the height of Idi Amin. Took me to another agricultural college called Bukarasa. Another uncle came and took me from there up to my town in Bali and put me in senior secondary school for A levels to study a very complicated exercise. And that exercise that, that uh, complicated, what do you call it? These days they call it semesters and so on. My combi ah, this is called combination, BCG, this is biology, chemistry, and the geography. Because I passed geography with a distinction too. The only thing I failed, uh, the audience watching is mathematics. Don't ever bring mathematics near me. I got a nine, zero out of mathematics. So while I was there in Balestina Second School, I changed it to religious uh, divinity, English divinity, English literature divinity, and, and geography. So during the study there, I mean, put people on the firing squad, 1975, 76, we started activities against Idi Amin. 1978, I left and I went to join, to cut the long story short, to start struggling against Idi Amin as a younger man. So you can guess my age from finishing senior four in 1974. You can guess what age I am today. Because I'm told these days people fear age, telling age, and uh, I'm one of those, but mine is about 65 and above. If you like me, like me. If you don't, it's your problem. But I'm not in 70s. I am just around there. I'm about 60s five and some months coming to 66. Why have I started with 
the prayer. Today in Africa, we need prayer. I want to thank all of you for joining in in this conference so that we make a prayer. We prepare our people from the pandemic. I want to make it clear that this is the starting point for people to start preparing and talking about what will happen when the pandemic goes. We might not all be there. Few people might be there. Many people might remain. But the difficulties of this pandemic will not go away. Ladies and gentlemen, those watching us, millions and millions of you watching us from here, we have lined up many speakers. And I will introduce those speakers who are already in the house and some are already online. But the purpose of this conference is that global problems need global solutions. African problems need African solutions. Are we right? Africans today, we seem to be needing other solutions than our own solutions. If you see what Professor Pierre Lumumba, who will be speaking later on, has been telling Africa, they seem not to understand. In 19, in 2013, 2011, 2012, when the United Nations Security Council wanted a vote to go and bombard Libya, one of the countries in Africa that put up its hand to bombard Libya. Do you know the country? South Africa. Who was the president? Zuma. What is happening to Zuma today? What is happening to Zuma today? That is the Africa we are looking at. Can that Africa prepare beds for people? People now want Zuma in jail. But Muhammad Gaddafi, who, wanted, who defended Africa, is gone. They bombarded him. They destroyed his country. A country that was giving people food. By now, if Muhammad Gaddafi had been there, he would have flown tents and medicine to the rest of Africa. How many African countries are sharing the little that they have? My conference wants to address those type of problems. Are we united? Is the AU ready to help us to move and create an environment where we share the little? This morning I watched and I listened a video from President Museven. And I would like to, I don't know whether the, 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 the broadcasting system is here. You have that video? President Museven is video. Can we play that video and I pause a minute? I pause a minute because I'm coming to several subjects. Two minutes. We shall play that video for you all over the world and millions watching us. See how an African leader, my president, is saying for the first time he's saying the truth. Surely, we have waited for US, UK, European Union to give us the medicine. We are busy abducting people across, you know, <laughs> taking people from one corner. Why are they, those guys have vaccinated their people. We are busy hunting others, intercepting them in planes the way they have done it to my friend Namdi Khan. We shall come to that subject later. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make is the video playing. The point I'm trying to make is 66 years 
after independence. Are we ready? Can we make one medicine called Africa medicine? People are fighting. People are fighting over the medicine, a donation. I'm shocked the audience, the conference, this summit, whatever you are, people are fighting over donations. A donation given by European countries. Some ministers are fighting over it. Some government officials are selling it. Will Africa have a solution? The answers will come from the conference. Let's listen to what President Museveni said about Africa. So that you can know. Today, many people might think this conference is a, just a, a talk, talk shop. No. Tomorrow, you are going to see very many people coming to call this type of conferences. Too late. Africa, we are never proactive. We are reactive. If you, the meeting is on Monday, an African will go for a visa on Sunday, even if force break the embassy, which is closed in Nairobi or Lagos or Abuja or Khartoum, that I want a visa, I'm going tomorrow for a meeting in London. Oh, I'm going tomorrow for a meeting in Brussels. We are never proactive. So with this disease, with this pandemic, is Africa ready? What is the progress in our situation? What can businesses do? Is there anybody mobilizing the business community in this world, in this country, Kenya, for example, to do a standby loan Stand by finances. I am pleased that Uganda, starting from 60th, the Uganda government will be giving, it has already singled out people because Uganda has got an identity card, ID. Kenya did not do Uduma number and finish. I want to tell you, Uganda has got an ID, so they have already known how many people need the money? And starting from 6th of July, the Uganda government will be giving 100,000 Kenya sh uh, Uganda shillings per person of that category. That is a step forward. That is a very good step. First of all, there are people, our parents, our grandparents, who cannot afford this medicine. So is the video ready? Okay, let's watch the video. You can sleep too much. I have never believed in independence. Therefore, this, <laughs> this unfortunate phenomenon where people have vaccines and they say, no, we must first vaccinate our own people. That's unfortunate, but I like it. Because it wakes you, you Africans. Africans are a disgrace to ourselves. Why do you have to depend on, on the outside for everything? Life, you depend on the outside, why? This is a big shame for Africa. You people, how can you sit here as, as if you are imbeciles? That we are dying, we are waiting for foreigners to come and save us. We shall die until the foreigners come to save us. What sort of people are, are, are you? And you are uh, trained. It is the orientation. It is a slave mentality. This selfishness in the world is bad, but it's good. I like it because it wakes up Africans. It wakes up Africans. It's a shame that the whole of the African continent is just asleep, waiting for to be saved by, by others. 
If they don't save us, we shall die like happened with the slave trade. How can this be? Slave trade went on here for 400 years. These idiot chiefs were here just putting on monkey skins and so on. Looking like clowns. So therefore, although this is bad, but, but, but me, there is a good thing in it. To wake, to wake up the Africans. So I go back to the written speech now. Ladies and gentlemen, conference participants, you, you have heard it, and I believe the, the, the main speakers will agree with me that for the first time, not if the first time, President Museveni has been talking of thinking African. One of the things that I cannot disagree with His Excellency President Museveni is that he has a Pan-African heart. He likes Pan-Africanism. Every time he talks, he talks Pan-Africanism. The same with President oh, Kenya. No, we didn't see the video. Hello? Please. Are you, are you there now? Who is that? If you are, if you are not speaking, unmute, uh, sorry, mute your, yes, mute, mute, mute your phone because we can't hear you. Uh, we, we don't want to hear you talk, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. He has always talked about Africa. And today he has made his point last night. I agree. Two things that I agree with President Museveni is Pan-Africanism and security. He has brought security, secured our country and the region, when Somalia needed the troops, he sent them. He's now even telling Sadak he's going to Mozambique to liberate the northern, the southern, the north, southern part of, Moza, of, of, of Tanzania, that is actually where most of the terrorists are escaping to. That is very good. That's a very good gesture. Other things of democracy, it is up to people. We don't eat. People say they don't eat much democracy. But if there is security, you can maneuver to get out of such areas. But on Pan-Africanism, he has told people to wake up and do some things. And therefore, let's give him a credit. Yesterday, you can make judgment yourselves what type of... Africa you want. Before I sit down and I invite one of our main speakers this morning, I want to remind you of a letter and I hope my people will open it up. I don't know. I want to remind you of a letter that I wrote on 18th of February 2020. 2020. 18th February as they look for that letter. It was a letter written when I was in The Hague in Holland. I had gone there to, represent, uh, to fight against the International Court of Justice about the boundaries between Kenya and Somalia. I saw on the plane when I was flying into The Hague and landed at the Shifo Airport conference, I saw everybody with a mask. All the Chinese ladies, South Korea and Japanese, everybody had a mask. So, and they were covering their nose and the mouth. This is the true experience. 
experience. So I turned to Kenya Airways ladies and the captain and the others as we were putting our suitcases out. They were waiting for their bus and I was also going to the same hotel called Ikrami Plaza in Ishifo Airport. I turned on these ladies and the gentlemen and I said, hello, well, how come we have just come from Kenya without two masks? And everybody here looks like they have masks. People said, ah, there is a disease in uh, China and uh, that Asian places. Then I said, this disease could also be here. Jokingly. And I ran to, as they went to their bus, there's a chemist nearby. <laughs> I went to the chemist, I said, please, can you give me the mask? Then uh, the man said, yes, yes, yes. Everybody, all of us are having masks here. Then that chemist, uh, English, uh, uh, Dutch guy told me, it better you buy a whole box. So I bought the whole box and I went with it to the hotel. When I arrived at the hotel, another crew from South Korean airline arrived with masks again. All of them were masked. I said, oh, I called the captain his room. I said, it's better our Kenya Airways crew should have these masks. This is 20th of, no, 18th of February 2020. I wrote that letter to all African heads of state, alerting them after seeing what was happening in Wuhan. I said, Can, are we prepared enough if hospitals in Wuhan and Italy cannot accommodate people? What about us in Africa? And guess what? This morning, I was listening to the Kenyan television and I heard some people even gongered it or ate the money <laughs> for COVID. They bought, did they buy, they buy second-hand computers or something? You know, people are heartless. Money was eaten. The Auditor General of the Republic of Kenya said, instead of buying the real computers, they added the price of one billion shillings. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And the Kenyans might not receive that money ever. So these are the difficulties that we want to address. And I want to thank you all. First of all, I want to thank all the dignitaries watching across the world, because I've seen from here quite a lot of activity from the numbers. Thank you very much for watching us. We have lined out speakers. The first speaker on the podium will be Professor P.L.O. Lumumba. Professor P.L.O. Lumumba and I come a long way. This White Sands is very historical for us that it was the first time that Professor P.L.O. Lumumba told me in a conference here that, was it here? Yes. He told me that, did you know that Matanga's village has jiggers? <laughs> That's why Matanga's legs are like that. So I stood up, I said, Professor, my legs, the tribe, my tribe, where I come from, we don't suffer from jiggers. There is a tribe that suffers from jiggers. And that tribe are Basoga from Uganda, not Bagisu. Bagisu don't suffer from jiggers. We don't have jiggers in our... <laughs> People laughed. General, I remember General Basanjo made a laughter. Said, jiggers, so your legs have jiggers. Don't bring them on the platform. But Professor PLO has been my friend. 
a great friend of mine, an uncle, he calls me uncle. You know, he's very small, but very powerful. He's a constitutional lawyer. He read constitutionalism. He will interpret everything that uh, we've in line with COVID-1 regulations and any international matter that might come across today. Then our second speaker will be Simon Ekapa. I don't, I think he's there. Simon, yes. Our si second speaker will be Simon Ekapa from Finland, a Nigerian who lives in Finland. He's also not a Nigerian, a Biafran. Because the other time I called him that, he was very upset with me. He is, I will tell you his credentials and when he comes on the stage. The other speaker will be Mr. Edward Kawesa, Kuesa, Kusewe, sorry. I like, I like his Ugandan name. He looks like a Kuesa. <laughs> Edward Kusewe. Edward Kusewe deals with business technicalities, trade, all this cross-border trade, AU, all that is his field, Dr. Kuesa, Kusewe. He will be speaking live to us. Then other Biafrans, Africans from Harare, from the Indian Ocean coast, from South Africa, all of you are welcome and they will be speaking as we go on. So thank you very much. We have Professor P.L. Olumumba coming up to speak to us. Let's take notes. Let's ask questions when he's finished. Let's hear his wisdom. He has spoken and he has made the audience go up. He has told Africa several times that we glorify our thieves. That's one of the things that I like most about PLO. He said, the one day he was in Kampala, then I told him, why? I, I watched and my heart went up when he said, there are thieves here. I said, here in Kampala, I don't know whether he will come back, but he came out. Then he went to Tanzania. The worst is they are here. The, the very many of us, so prof, many younger generation, many Africans are waiting for you to talk about COVID during before, during, and after. What can the businesses do? What can African governments do? We are setting a pace. We are not going to be the owners of the policy. We are just setting a pace. Welcome to the show and address as Professor Piero Lumumba. And address the world is watching. Since you are an expert of international law, you can also touch on the question of treaties and extradition. Thank you. You want a pen? start by uh, thanking the Pan-African Forum Limited for putting together this hybrid interaction uh, this morning uh, to interrogate a subject that is as important as it is topical. The state of Africa before COVID, during COVID, and for want of a better word, we claim that there will be a post-COVID. There may not be 
a post-COVID speaking very strictly, COVID may very well be with us and we will learn to deal with it and to conquer it. There is a sense in which those who look at Africa take the view that the problems of Africa have been overanalyzed and that indeed we do have a proper diagnosis of African problems. The only problem is that we don't appear to identify the right antidotes. It is not the first time that Africa has been devastated by a medical condition. The only distinction that we now have is that COVID has been defined as a pandemic to mean that it has ravaged the entire world. And that cannot be denied. But Africa has seen epidemics. Many of you who are present virtually will remember the devastating effects of Ebola, which ravaged the western part of Africa only a few years ago and indeed did make a comeback during this year. Many of you will remember the impact of cholera and other diseases that have had their say in the continent of Africa. The impact of epidemics and now pandemic have been devastating to African societies, African politics, and indeed, African economies much more visibly. But in order to appreciate the situation of the continent of Africa, sometimes it is important to have a historical context. And that context is one that must remind us that in, an, in our unguarded moments, we speak about Africa as if she were homogeneous, and I'm using the word homogeneity very deliberately in order for me to demonstrate that Africa is not as homogeneous as we would want to have it be, and that in itself is necessary to point out because that also defines how we respond to situations. Africa is, as I speak, divided into 54 sovereign countries, 55 if you include the Arab Republic of Sahrawi, over which Morocco lays a claim. This claim to sovereignty does define how African countries respond to situations. You will agree with me that the so-called Francophone countries in Africa, whether they like it or not, ordinarily take a cue from Paris. And their reaction to matters economics, matters politics, is very Francocentric, if you permit me. There is also a sense in which those countries which were formerly colonized by the United Kingdom, despite their denial to the contrary, also have a very Anglo-centric response to issues economics and issues political, particularly when they operate under the aegis of the Commonwealth of Nations, which, as you know, pretend to be a community of equal states, but is essentially a backwater attempt by the United Kingdom to retain political tutelage over her colonies. The countries which were colonized by Portugal do not suffer quite the same fate 
because Portugal, as you know, was a backwater European country which lost its luster. And one can say that in terms of actual control, they do not have as much leverage on Cabo Verde, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, or Mozambique as the French would over her former colonies. And aside from those erstwhile colonizers, I've not mentioned the Spaniards in Equatorial Guinea, I've not mentioned the Belgians in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I've not mentioned the Italians who had a stint in uh, Somalia. They are Johnny come latelys into the African scene. And these Johnny come latelys are countries which were not traditionally colonizers, but post World War II acquired quite some strength. The United States of America leads in that regard. And many countries, including European countries, do take their cue from the United States of America because of its economic and indeed military might. A lot more recently, we have seen the advent of China, which in her emergence and in her political and economic diplomacy has bailed out, and I use the word bail out in quotation marks because it is debatable whether they have been truly bailed out, but China has become a big power in the African continent. There is today no country, or if there is very few, if there are very few, we do not have the Chinese engaged in some economic activity that do not look at the human rights situation and environmental situation. In other words, China is an emerging hegemon in the African continent. The Soviet Union somehow is also beginning to have a footprint. Much more recently, as we have seen with the establishment of military bases in Central African Republic and in the Sudan. That is the state of Africa. And it's important to put that in perspective so that when we talk about the COVID situation, we are able to see that there is a scramble for Africa. There was a scramble for Africa which led to the Berlin Conference in 1884 and 1885, and out of which African countries were petitioned. Then we regained independence, and I think that is also important. On what platform did we regain our independence? And one listens and must listen very keenly to some of the leaders of the African independence struggle in the 1960s and in the 1950s and, and, and later even in the 70s and the 80s in order to appreciate that Africa promised herself, herself a number of things that we were going to fight poverty, that we were going to fight ignorance, and that we were going to fight disease. Our agenda was clear. We were clear that at the time of the colonial hegemony, our people were denied good health facilities. Our people were denied opportunities that sound education offer. Our people are denied resources and they merely act out a living while their resources were being taken out of the continent. Those were the promises, whether it was Kwame Nkrumah speaking in Ghana in 1957 or Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria in 1961 or Nyerere in Tanganyika, then Tanzania or Kaunda or later Mugabe, or Mandela, or Nuyoma, or NATO, or Marshall, or Namdi Azikiwe, all of them were speaking the same language. And courtesy of history, if you listen to the early ideas of some of these individuals, they were quite clear. They were clear that we had to have our resources under our control because it is only in that way that we could build economies which would then form the foundation stone upon which we would be able to conquer the things that stood in our way towards total liberation. And those 
were summarized by the words of the Sagia for Kwame Nkrumah when he said, Seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest will come. His idea was that political independence was not an end in itself, but a means to an end. And what was the end? The end was fundamentally economic liberation, social cohesion, and of course that must be understood in the broadest of senses that independence not only required but demanded that we were able to give unto ourselves the things that we had been denied. But in order not to bog ourselves into that history which is very well known, you will see a number of things that were recognized in those early days. That one of the things that we had to do, and you will see these in the speeches that were delivered on the 24th and 25th days of May 1963 by the leaders of the then independent African countries, almost to a man, saying that it was important that we begin to liberate ourselves economically, that we ensure that we do not depend on our erstwhile colonizers, and indeed to move forward. In 1980, in Lagos, Nigeria, African heads of state met again and took the view under the Lagos Plan of Action that Africa had to reduce dependency on Europe and America if she were to enjoy sustainable development. But it is ironical and paradoxical at once that is during that period that the International Monetary Fund and the Bretton Woods Institution was also present in Africa under the structural adjustment programs where African countries were being micromanaged from Washington, D.C. This is important because I'll be demonstrating as I conclude that IMF is back again. And one of the things that we will be talking about, therefore, is how have we dealt with that situation in terms of dealing with these factors that now place us in a very difficult situation as a continent. After 1980, you will know that later in, 19, in 2013, Africa once again took the view that we had to take charge of our affairs and it is in that context that we came up with Africa Agenda 2063 and early this year we came up with the African continent of free trade area. That is not to mention the things that have happened in the region under SADC, things that have happened under ECOWAS, things that have happened under the East African community and COMESA and other regional bodies which are designed to address the economic problems. One may wonder why it is necessary to mention such things. It is mandatory and fundamental. Because when COVID came, all the ideas that had been programmed to, take, to gain traction were disturbed and torpedoed with the consequence that if a country took the view that it would liberate herself economically, she suddenly found herself in a situation where her economic agenda had been thoroughly disrupted. And that is exactly what COVID did. COVID came at a time when African countries were thoroughly unprepared and it's always noteworthy that in, in the 2000, I think it's in the year 2001, in the month of April in Abuja in Nigeria, African countries had actually met and said that they would dedicate 15% of their budget to the health sectors. That did not happen. The country that came nearest to achieving that was Rwanda. But even Rwanda did not achieve it. Namibia also came close to achieving that, which mean, meant, therefore, that in the medical arena, African countries were thoroughly unprepared. So thoroughly unprepared that our pharmaceutical industries in the continent do not constitute more than 10% of the entire global pharmaceutical arena. That is the level of unpreparedness. And even if you look at the institutes that are involved in research in the medical arena, 
you will agree with me that they do not have the financial capacity or the scientific firepower to deliver to the people of Africa. The net effect is that Africa has remained in a state of dependence. In the early days of COVID, there was an attempt by a number of African countries to respond in a manner that I thought would be embraced by other countries, but it never came to pass. Many of you will remember that the Malagasy Institute of Applied Science did actually come up with what they considered was a cure, the COVID organic, but it was poo-pooed by most African countries and somehow it disappeared into the horizon and not much mention is being made of it. You'll also remember that there was an attempt to bring up rapid response testing kits by the Louis Pasteur Institute in Dhaka in Senegal. Once again, that did not happen. And when the COVID had done its worst, ravaged economies, Africa did not know how to respond. African economies that were dependent on the export of raw materials with little value addition suddenly found themselves in a quandary. African countries that were involved in the export of agricultural products such as cut flour, countries such as Kenya and Ethiopia suddenly discovered that flour was no longer needed. African countries whose economy were buoyed by tourism, expecting tourists from Europe and America suddenly had to close their hotels. So that as I speak to you now, there is not a single African country that has not been ravaged by COVID. The truth is that African economies have shrunk. Young men and women have lost jobs. Countries can no longer service their debts, and the economic situation and outlook is as grim and as gloomy as it has ever been. Begging the question, is it possible for African countries to get out of this hole? A little earlier, you had a clip by the Ugandan president, Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, with whom I agree on his analysis that Africa has found herself exposed and once again as she does, and when I use the word Africa, I'm using it deliberately to mean all so-called sovereign African countries, we are out in the world with bowels in our hands. If we are not begging to be given Pfizer vaccine, we are begging for Sinopharm. If we are not begging the Chinese, we are begging the Russians for Sputnik. If we are not begging the Russians, we are begging the Americans for Johnson & Johnson and Moderna. We are on a begging spree. And the wisdom of history has always been if you do not produce your own food and you do not produce your own medicine, you are at the mercy of others because who knoweth what is in medicine that you do not produce and in food that you do not produce. The irony is that since many African countries regained independence, we have men and women in the arena of science, and the question that we must ask, where are they? Where are the great Nigerian thinkers who have gone to the best universities in the world? Where are the great Kenyan thinkers, the Ghanaians, the Ugandans, the South Africans, the Zambians and Malawians? They are eloquent in their silence. Where are the governments which, since we regained independence, have always had as a permanent feature in their government's ministries of health, complete with budgets every year? Where are those ministries? Where are the ministers? Where are the presidents who, when they are turned international arena, like all other presidents, received 21 gun salutes? 
and whose governments have five-year development plans, where are they? Where are they when little Cuba is capable of producing a vaccine? Where are they? How can it be that a continent that has nearly two billion people is incapable of producing a vaccine? The world must ask and wonder at once. And unfortunately, the reality is that we find ourselves where we find ourselves, at the mercy of other civilizations. And yet, even as we lament, because lament we must, we have been caught in a bad place. We do not know what to do with our shrinking economies. We are now being told how to run our economies. Countries that were lending us are beginning to hold back because they can see that we are sinking deeper and deeper into the muck and mire of debt and that it will be impossible for us to salvage ourselves. Yet, the old saying and the cliche at once that it is darkest before dawn. And that is why I hold the view that this is indeed a wake-up call for Africa. The late president of Tanzania, John Joseph Pombe Magufuli, before he was gathered to his fathers, was very clear about this. That if Africa is to realize our potential, she has no choice but to begin to do things which she can underwrite and make sustainable. Africa is gone, only going to liberate ourselves from the chains of COVID if we act in unison. Perhaps it will not be possible to do so in the dramatic way that we want, but I can see that the African Union now has a center for disease control with five regional centers, but it's also not lost on me that the Center for Disease Control in Addis Ababa will, is going to be financed 100% by the Chinese. So that even as we seek independence, there is a sense in which the chains of control are alive and well. But be that as it may, I hold the view that we are capable of moving in a useful socio-economic and political direction if we begin to collaborate. So what do I prescribe? I hold the view that it must start regionally. The East African region comprising the countries of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and even in the Horn, in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, in Somalia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo must begin to move together initially as the countries of SADC must also begin to move as we go forward as must the countries of West Africa and those of Central Africa. In my view, therefore, it is important that we share our resources in a sound manner and begin to animate not only our institutes of research but also our universities because history has demonstrated not once, not twice, that the only way in which you can deal with things which require scientific intervention is by ensuring that you resource your research and development. I'm therefore suggesting that one of the things that must happen and must happen urgently is that African governments must now segment a portion of the national budget to be deployed in the arena of research and development and to be done in such a manner that is going to be anticipatory. We must not, as Dr. Masanga said a little earlier, be a people who are reactive. We must be proactive in the manner in which we deal with these things. So going forward, I hold the view that collaboration and cooperation is going to be the thing that will help Africa liberate ourselves from the vagaries of COVID-19. I hear, as I said a little earlier, people speaking as if there will be a time when we will discuss COVID in the past tense. I am not a scientist, I do not claim to be one, but there is a sense in which I suspect that COVID 
given the manner in which it is mutating, will always be present within us. And what we must do, as we have done with other epidemics, is to ensure that indeed we have vaccines, that we have medicine, and that therefore we are prepared at all times, knowing as we do that this is not the last pandemic. There will be other pandemics, and Africa must be prepared. The day before yesterday, as I conclude, I listened to the president of China speaking to the Chinese people and telling the world that his country has risen and is rising and that anybody who dares to stand in the way of his country will be met with a wall of 1.4 billion. My message to Africa is that as long as we continue to operate these little countries which have no economic backbone, which have no political backbone, which have no backbone, will always be the victims of other civilization. My clarion call is that Africa must move towards collaboration and towards unity. Kwame Nkrumah was a prophet ahead of his times, I must say, in matters politics. As early as 1963 in his book, Africa Must Unite, he said, that Africa is capable of being an important player in the world if she unites. But if we continue to cheat ourselves that with our little unviable countries, we can thrive and participate in the, with the rest of the world, we will once again be colonized by imperialism, which he says may change its masks, but also always a way of coming back under the guise of investment or some other things. The warning is on the wall. And it is the duty of you and I to now use our little opportunities and the little spaces in which we are, in which we are to speak truth to power in the hope that those who wield power will respond to these voices of lamentation because it is only if they do that Africa will be salvaged from the vagaries not only of COVID, but other epidemics which are waiting in the wings. But I lose, I choose not to lose hope because I know that one day, united and focused, we will be able to conquer. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to your contribution as we enrich this conversation. God bless you. viewers, <clears throat> those watching us the conference, I want to thank Professor P. L. O. Mumba for the kind words, the kind contribution, the contribution he has made to Africa. And he continues to make his contribution. Remember, There are those who went to Emperor Nero and told Emperor Nero that there are some people who know how to talk to the spirits. I don't know how they used to call them in the Bible. Seers. And then another group went to the mother of Emperor Nero and I told Emperor Nero that, Mother, 
that there, are, there is a new thinking and that new thinking in the empire of Rome is beginning to catch up, catch fire. The truth is Christianity began with the second group. But the first group that had gone to Emperor Nero, who was the son of the mother, did not say the truth. They changed the tactics. They said in order to make Emperor Nero hate Christians. But Emperor Nero decided to call Christians to his palace and guess what happened? When they prayed some of the things, he started having a new change, a new spirit. Our conferences have been and continue to be, can Africa have a renaissance? A rebirth, a renaissance, the new generation that are going to remain behind to struggle for freedom, for the rights of the people of Africa, is the generation we are talking to today. Can you have a renaissance? Can Africa have a rebirth? We are still begging for medicine from the same people who colonized us after 66 years of independence. We are still butchering our own people, kidnapping them, intercepting them, dragging them, and without telling them why they are being taken. That's the Africa we have. That's the continent we have, which PLO Mumba has summarized and has said. When can we change? Shall we change? And have engineers, teachers in Nigeria, in Biafra, being able to manufacture a needle. Is there an African country that manufactures toothpicks? <laughs> the one we use for plucking food after we have eaten. But the timber from Congo is cut every day. And then you see truckloads of timber crossing from Uganda up to Mombasa where we are being exported to China for China to manufacture toothpicks. And you find Africans loaded in a plane, very many, calling themselves businessmen and women, going to carry toothpicks. Have you seen that yourselves? Ladies, especially ladies who are in the room here, I am sure one of you would like to do business in China. <laughs> that nowadays, the lady, the first thing to tell you, I want to bring my container from China. But the container you are bringing came from the, the trees. Container of toothpicks. That's what the professor is saying. When can we change and start doing something in Africa ourselves? Stop this behavior of human rights abuses, of beating up people, killing people, creating unnecessary wars. In Somalia, up here nearby, they have been fighting for a very long time. And every time we pump their money every day. I want to take this opportunity. Now, before I invite the second speaker to invite the brother of Mr. Namudi Khan, who is going to speak to us and to speak to the world right now. I would like to invite him to speak 
briefly before I come to the next speaker. I really don't know him, but he will, aha, there you are. There he is. That is the brother, the real brother of Namdi Khan. I have never seen him before. I don't know him. And I, I just am shocked. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome to this show. Welcome to this summit of an African nature. And therefore, I want to invite you to introduce yourself. I want to thank the people of Biafra, those who have uh, come out to condemn, like I have condemned the actions of interception. Interception. And the PLO, I think you better, you will come back to tell us, you are, you, are, you are a student of law, international law, and the constitutional law. What is this interception? Reduction. Taking people in the air, dragging them out of place where they have gone to seek asylum. What, where, where, who can allow this in the 21st century? Who? Thank you very much. I would like to that is not him. No. Um, thank you. That is him. I think, yes. Thank you very much, sir. You are now, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. God bless you. That you can now take the floor. Thank you very much, sir, for having me here, Dr. Masaka. And before I could make any speech, I have known you for some time now, not as far back as 2016. Yes. When my brother was incarcerated, that was when we established the first contact with you, Punchline TV. I remember vividly. And then um, I have seen the news making around them social media about what happened to our leader, who happens to be my brother, Mazen Namdekano, in Kenya, and the, what people are saying about it. Please, I sincerely apologize on behalf of the leader of indigenous people of Biafra, Mazen Namdekano, and Biafran people to you because you are not part of what happened. I repeat, you are not part of what happened. Although the kidnapping of my brother took place in Kenya, Nairobi, which virtually everybody is denying today, even including the Kenyan government. But that reminds me of one thing. I don't know why we should allow such a thing to happen. I want to tell His Excellency, the President of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, what his name stands for, Uhuru, stands, means freedom. And probably he never knew why such a name was given to him. Years back, when the father, his own father, let Jomo Kenyatta was accused of being a terrorist because he was leading then the organization called Mau Mau. When the colonial masters accused him of killing his own people and even the colonial occupiers then, it is or it was Dr. Ndamde Azikiwe, that rounded up a group of lawyers, local and international, with then Eastern region money to come to the aid of Jomo Kenyatta and said he would not leave to see him hang, being hanged by anybody. 
and that same Dr. Nnamdazikiwe comes from the same place which Mazi Nnamdekan. And for the Kenyan government to allow such a thing to happen, and they are pretending as if they never knew what happened. It's a shame on Kenyan people because we know that Kenyan people are very peaceful people, very kind and loving people. One, he was adopted. My brother, Namde Kano, is not a Nigerian and is not a holder of Nigerian passport. He is a British citizen. And let us not misunderstand exactly what happened. Some people might call it kidnap. Some people might call it an adoption. Some might call it a rearrest. There was nothing like that. This is one of the most heinous crimes any state could commit against a nation. And this is called extraordinary rendition. Then that led me to ask questions about what Kenyan government are doing. I remember about 15 years ago, Portland, the PDK leader, was the Turkish government. Given the same thing, and today, a few days ago, who is manning Kenyan borders? Is it foreigners? Or is it not Kenyan that are manning their own borders? This is very, very laughable. They should understand that Nankan is a British citizen, and we are expecting the Kenyan to take the lead. And I know that the British authority, they are doing everything they can think themselves to make sure to get this issue resolved. As we speak now, that the Khan is going under severe torture. He has the medical issues. And the same Nigerian government could not allow the Khan to have access to doctor or to medication. This is what is happening at this minute as we speak. And the question I'm asking is, what is the British government doing? What Namde Khan is asking for is what every other person asked, including the father of His Excellency, the President, Uhuru Kenyatta. That was why your father gave you that name, because he fought for the freedom of the Kenyan people. And selling your own people where they'll be killed. I think this is the worst thing you can do as a Pan-Africanist. We are working to keep Africa free. We are working to make sure that Africa develops the way it's supposed to be. But it's very, very unfortunate that people who we are looking onto are the ones misleading us. And I'm calling on the African community, EU, European Union, United Kingdom, United States of America, to intervene in this case, because this is the worst crime any state could commit against any nation. This is called extraordinary rendition. It is not kidnapping or adoption. For that reason, I wouldn't want to go into more details, but hopefully in the next days to come, people will know exactly what played out. I can categorically say it again. My brother was adopted in Kenya, and I'm calling on Kenyan government to step up to their responsibility and tell the international community what happened at this 21st century. Such things are not allowed anywhere. And I once again, I thank you, Dr. David Matenga. Please, do not be angry on your people. You've worked for Biafra, you are working for Biafra, and you continue to do it. We are not paying you. You are doing the job because of your love for freedom. And don't allow anything to deter you. I apologize again on behalf of Mazin Namdekan, the leader of indigenous people of Biafra, and the entire Biafrans to you. Please. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you very much, my comrade. Comrade. The recording has stopped. Thank you very much, comrade at arms. Comrade in arms in the struggle for the people, the oppressed. I would not, and I have never lost any iota of my blood thinking about working with anybody who oppresses the people of any race anywhere in the world. 
in my 36 years in exile, I have supported very many people, including Obasanjo, Chief Abiola, and the other guy who was killed in prison. We supported, we demonstrated with Nigerians together with the, the former presiding president of the International Criminal Court, Osuji, in London. We took the London Embassy of Nigeria, surrounded it for several hours, breaking windows in order for the Prime Minister, Ken Sarwa. I stood from together every Friday from 3 p.m up to about eight, every Friday until Abacha released and killed the rest. Abiola was killed. That Obasanjo, you see they are walking with his, uh, his African journeys. It's because of my, my voice and I feel very hurt when somebody could even think of me. I did not know where Mr. Namudikan was. I didn't even know he comes to Kenya. I don't know. But I've been struggling for the people of Biafra for six years, voluntarily, and I will continue to do so until he gets fair justice. I'm not going to keep quiet. No, I am don't work for the government of Republic of Kenya. The government of Kenya itself as a Minister of Foreign Affairs and Internal Security. They will find out, maybe it was done, I don't know, because at least now you have been in touch with the lawyers of Namdu Khan. They have told you exactly the truth. We don't know, I don't know what happened, I was shocked. But of course, you will have Buhari and his henchmen turning propaganda on. You know that interview we did shook Buhari because we told the world the truth. That interview on 21st of May, my viewers and the listeners and the conference took Mr. Buhari to the bones because this time the whole world had. The British government had the truth about what is happening in Biafra. So we are enemies. Maybe I'm equally the enemy, the next target. I don't know. That is all I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Conference, we now turn to invite one of our speakers. We had we had already arranged without knowing that the circumstances would be there. And I don't know whether it is in the interest we take a break first, but the break will come later, let's finish. And have at the moment, Mr. Simon Ekapa. Simon Ekapa, please, can you step up? Simon Ekapa is a Biafran. He has been following my shows for a long time. And he also broadcasts from Finland and he has been one of those advocating for change, a referendum in Nigeria. But the pandemic touches all of us. Today, our, our topic was the pandemic, COVID-19. What do we do? Of course, the Buharis have, have already got money to fly to, to London, Charing Hospital. By the way, Nigerians, whenever he goes to London, he goes to Charing Hospital. Let's crowd there this time. I'm going to mobilize with crowd there so that that hospital has no entry, so that he does not come out. Let them fly him through the roof. 
That's what we did to Paul Robia. That's what we have done to some African president whose plane was impounded. We had refused to pay our money. <laughs> so he has touched the wrong button. This is this one here. When I'm in London, I'm difficult. So thank you very much, Ekipa. Thank you. Simon. Simon is going to introduce himself. I want to thank you, brother. Thank you for continuing feeding the world with the correct information regarding our brother who is now sick and is not being given medicine. I'm sure the British government is going to take action to find out who exactly did this heinous crime of taking a person who is not Boko Haram. He's not part of the Boko Haram. And yet they can allow Boko Haram people to fly to get medicine and come back. <laughs> you see, that is the, the, the whole thing of what is happening in Nigeria. Thank you. Simon, take the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Matsanga. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my own very brother, uh, Kano Unta, for uh, showing on this uh, particular program in this critical moment to render apology on behalf of all of us to Dr. Matsanga. Uh, you are in a very best and better position to know what has happened and a lot of things that so many people do not know. So let me use this opportunity to ask all Biafrans to cease henceforth either pointing finger at Dr. Matsanga. The fact now is that apology has been rendered on behalf of all Biafrans and on behalf of our leader, Mazin Namdekano. And anybody that goes for that to start pointing finger at Matsanga, we will regard you as the enemy because you are not in the position to accuse anybody. You are not in the position to accuse anybody about what happened to our leader. Now, I also want to thank Professor Lumumba for being and showing on this program. I have longed for this day to come in the sense that there are people, people like you who are well respected. Your opinion in African affairs matters a lot. And I have longed for this day to come to be able to share ideas objectively. And I hope that after this uh, discussion today, we will have more discussions to come on Africa. Also, for those who are angry, for those dear friends who are angry, we understand you, how you feel. The point now is that we are not going to be making any uh, statement anyhow in order not to give the criminals in the government ideas of how to cover up what they have done. So that is the reason why we will not go into details in discussing about the, uh, the uh, you know, the kidnap or the, uh, the abduction, or however you, you call it, of our leader. We will not go into details in discussing those things because we do not want to give this is still under investigation. We do not want to give the people that committed this crime any opportunity to cover up anything. And you all should abide and understand that. Uh, listening to Professor Lumumba, uh, I, 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 I'm kind of amazed by the point he raised. Let me try by saying this. Professor Lumumba started by lamenting about how Africa has failed. 
I listened to him very attentively, waiting to hear when he is going to talk something good about Africa. I did not hear that. Professor Lumumba continued to say, in Africa, we are all prepared for COVID-19. The question is, were Africa really unprepared for COVID-19? The answer is yes. Africa, we are unprepared, very unprepared for COVID-19. Another issue and a very critical point he raised was that no single Africa country that has not been ravaged by COVID-19. Is this particular position true? The answer is yes. But then, when you compare to, when you compare what has happened in Africa to what happens in some of the countries in Europe, it is not comparable. Italy was ravaged and people died like chicken in Italy during the outbreak of COVID-19. We have not witnessed the level of ravageness in Africa, like what happened in Italy. Now, I am driving at a point by making these two first uh, point that first of all, why did Lumumba think that Africa were unprepared. Any day we answer this question, Africa will begin to see development. Another thing is that Professor Lumumba, a well-respected professor, he said Africans are beggars. That during the COVID-19, we saw different African countries begging and begging. And whether this is true, the answer is yes. They begged. Another thing is, who are Africa begging from? Who are they begging from? They are begging from the people that take their natural resources. So who are they going to, what are they going to give to Africa? They give to Africa what was stolen from them. It's stolen. The natural resources and money taken from Africa, Africa will turn back and beg. Another question is, do we as Africa understand why we are beggars? Any day we answer this question, we are going to be free and become a developed continent. And I'm going to tell you solutions today. Now, he mentioned also, or he asked the question, he asked, where are all the educated Nigerians? Where are all the educated Ghanaians? Where are they who studied in Harvard and all what have you? <laughs> the question is, do you see those people who studied in Harvard in any government offices in Africa? Let us use Nigeria for example. The answer is no. Now, the question is why? Why you are not seeing those people that studied in Harvard leading the affair of African countries? I'm going to use Nigeria as a case study. And I'm going to tell you today why. Again, Professor Lumumba mentioned that where are these people who studied in Harvard medical schools when Cuba can produce and manufacture vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine? The same question is, do you know, Professor Lumumba, the reason why Cuba can manufacture and produce vaccine why the people from Africa who studied in Harvard cannot do the same thing? I am going to give you the answer. You may not agree with me, but I say today will be the beginning of a healthy discussion on Africa. 
And we hope we are going to have a very objective discussion. Professor Lumumba also said this is a wake-up call for Africa. And I agree with him 120%. He went further to say if Africa unites, if Africa unites, that Africa is going to be a great continent to lead the world. I agree with him. The question now is how will Africa unite? And another question is why haven't Africa united by 2021? Another question is why are there so many crises in all, almost all African countries? And on number four, question is, why do you have so many terrorist organizations and groups working freely, killing people in African nation? Now, we can never understand where the problem is coming from. We can never understand the solution or know the solution to this problem unless we know the source of the problem. Cuba is not a rich country, but Cuba have a very well advanced health system. They have in Cuba you have one of the best, one of the best doctors in the world. In Cuba, I do not know whether Professor Lumumba is aware of that. However, the problem of Africa is we are too diverse. What we call the diversity is the problem of Africa. I want to also put it to everybody watching us today that nobody has been able to actually conduct a thorough and a, a well investigated research medical research on how this COVID-19, how it could affect black Africans. Not black America, but black Africans. Do we have any kind of different journey that the COVID-19 not be actually very effective to break down the immune system of black Africans? Nobody has been able to research on that. And the question is why? Because Africa cannot do it. Africa do not have the possibility to conduct research to know how COVID-19 could affect the immune system of Africans and compare it to how it could affect the white, the Europeans, Indians and what have you. We do not have that kind of medical record. If we compare the level of uh, ravage of COVID-19 in a country like Italy, what we saw, the pattern of COVID-19 were to happen in Nigeria. We will be looking at 100 million people dying because there is no medical equipment. Nigeria begged and they even begged the CEO of Tesla to give them the, uh, some of the medical equipment during the outbreak of COVID-19. So, after having highlighted some of the interesting points raised by our professor, I would want to tell him today the reason why Africa were unprepared for COVID-19 and they will never be prepared. The reason is this. Africa have a very dangerous diversity, starting from Nigeria. And we needed a nation to drive or to be the lead of Africa civilization. The diversity in some of the African countries are very dangerous diversity. Remember, when you say dangerous diversity, it is really very dangerous one. Because diversity has never worked anywhere in the world. When you make reference to the European Union, 
One important thing Professor Mumba said also is that how can a country of two million we are able to produce COVID-19 vaccine. And that is a surprise to him. How could country of two, two million, two million, we are able to produce COVID-19 vaccine. But countries like large countries in Africa could not do it. The answer to this question is very simple. The place you see that you have two million people in that country, and they were able to produce this COVID-19 vaccine means that there is no dangerous diversity in that country of 2 million people. And the Africans should start to think towards this direction. We need to divide our diversity in, in, to be able to unite Africa. Without disintegrating the diversity in Africa, Africa can never ever be united. We need to pieces Africa. After pieces in Africa, we begin to come together for the unity and will eventually become the power of the world. Why did I say this? I am saying this because this is what is obtainable in the Western world today. This is what is obtainable. Somebody said, this is what is obtainable in America. This is what is obtainable in Europe. When you have a collapse on workable system, you can never manage any outbreak of any disease. You will not have any workable health equipment. You will not have a functional health sector. And like you rightly said, the African people were unprepared for COVID-19 and they can never be prepared in 200 years to come. Which the dangerous diversity we have in Africa. In Nigeria, for example, you could or uh, you would agree, agree with me that some of the people that piloted the COVID-19 in America were Nigerians. In fact, a Yoruba man was the leader, the lead research of COVID-19 in the US. Do you know why Nigeria cannot get it? Because the person that studied in Harvard or studied in one of the best universities in the world, you can't see them in Africa because the people that are governing African country most of them have ulterior motive. The ulterior motive is ethnic, religious, and cultural driven. And that is the reason why we say it is time to divide along. So when you listen to people who are educated, who have lived in the Western world, saying we need to come together, our diversity is our strength, and then I ask them a question. Can you tell us example anywhere in the world where the diversity has actually brought development and civilization? If you are able to give us one example of a country that has a very dangerous diversity and they were able to progress, we are going to listen to you. But as I speak today, the second day of July 2021, there is no country that has diversity, not to talk about the dangerous one, that are progressive. Europe divided along tribal line. Every country in Europe, they speak their language, they have their culture. The only ethnic group is the political party. The United Kingdom is a kingdom. It's a kingdom united, different kingdom united under one queen, under one king, under one kingdom. They have different culture, different languages, different governments, and they're divided along tribal lines. 
because they try to form a very strong force with their diversity and it didn't work. They fought war, very deadly and very, very brutal war, bloody war in England. Today, they are enjoying the dividends of dividing along tribal line. That's why you have a United Kingdom. It is a kingdom with different government, Wales, England, Ireland, Scottish, all these people are different. That's what we are asking, that if you want Africa to progress, if you want the second COVID-19, like you said, the coming of the second COVID-19, not to ravage Africa and kill our people. We need to start now to lay the foundation of becoming one of the powerful continents in the world. How do we do that? We have to start, we have to start to educate our people, channel our energies in preaching Biafra Nigeria disintegration. Because from there, we are going to lead the way for Africa freedom. Africa is not free. We cannot have all these natural resources. We cannot be blessed with all manner of natural resources. And our professors, our doctors recognize the fact that we are better. It is very absurd. We know how we, what we are going to do and how we cease from begging. Africa have what it takes for people to beg from Africa. And this will not happen until the diversity that is destroying Nigeria and Africa is being, is divided. The diversity in the sense that when you have people who are competent in the government, who are competent, who are educated, who are very conversant in handling health issues, you will not see them in the affair of the government. The government have ulterior motive. In Nigeria today, the biggest problem of Nigeria is the diversity. The diversity in Nigeria is a very dangerous one. You have cultural diversity. You have religious diversity. You have tribal diversity. And bringing all this diversity together you are not looking at a progressive Nigeria. Rather, everybody that comes to the affair of the government will try to drive ethnic, either ethnic, religious, or tribe. You are first Yoruba before a Nigeria. You are first a Muslim before accepting the secular state in Nigeria. You are first a Nottana, a, a Fulani before a Nigeria. You are first a Biafran before in Nigeria. And any time a Biafran finds himself in the position, he would want to favor the Biafra people. Any time a Yoruba find himself in the position, he would want to favor the Yoruba people. Any time the Fulani find themselves in position, he goes beyond borders to bring the entire Fulanis from all over Africa into Nigeria. Some of them today have built dynasty in Nigeria. They are the one telling us who to leave Nigeria and who not to leave Nigeria. And when you think about what to do for the development and progressive of Nigeria, they tell you, we are at number you. We are bigger than you. They tell you it is out of, it is a question of number. They tell you this is democracy. We have more people at the National Assembly than you. When you tell them restructure Nigeria so that Nigeria can progress, have growth, have good hospital, people can be employed out of competency, they tell you go and contest election in your local government. They are not interested in anything that will move Nigeria forward. Let me also make it very clear that what I'm preaching today along ethnic and tribal line, Nigeria has tried it. Nigeria practiced it. It worked. 
It worked that during the olden days, the Yoruba people have their own embassy in the United Kingdom. They are recognized. They have their consulate. They have their passport. They have their currency. They have their own wealth. Economy was booming. The Afro people enjoyed the same thing. The Northern people enjoyed the same thing. And only this can make Africa move forward. You need to start at a final point. You need a country that will be a final point for the progressive of Africa. You need a country that will be a cardinal point for other Africa to emulate. At this point, every country in Africa has failed, like you have to say, that all African countries have failed. You exempted only one African country who have tried to manage the COVID-19, but we do not want to continue managing. So on this note, let me allow whoever that's want to contribute and allow our professor to comment on this line of argument that today. And remember what I said, nowhere, anywhere in the world that you have diversity bringing civilization in that country. I do not need to go further to start giving professor what happened in Europe, what happened in Soviet Union, what happened in America, and how America is not in diversity. Because America have one single law. America, even all the states are divided, but America is found in Christianity. And I told people who argue that America have diversity, I told them that I disagree with you. Do not use America to give example of a, diverse, a diversified country. Because America, any day Islam, any day Sharia is implemented in America, then I will agree with you that America have now embraced diversity. Until then, America has no diversity. So do not use that as an example. Thank you very much, the audience, as I wait. As I wait to make my comment again after Professor or any other person that spoke. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was uh, Simon Akbar. I've been told the name is pronounced as Akbar, not Akbar. Akbar. So, uh, thank you so much for that submission. And I've seen you were calling on Professor to come to respond uh, to some of the points there that he made earlier that you challenged. And you asked a couple of questions. How can Africa unite? Why is Africa not united? And then you added there that uh, even in 200 years from now, Africa may not be able to achieve the unity that has been quite elusive and you've gone on to say that our disunity has been quite a disservice uh, to this continent. Also highlighting the issue of ethnicity and uh, inclusivity that sometimes uh, lacks in our, a lot of our African states. So before I call on the next um, uh, speaker, I'd like to invite Professor Pierlo to come and respond to some of those uh, questions that you've raised there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. I'm very happy that you've teased out a number of very useful things. In fact, in point of fact, I don't think we agree on much, uh, particularly when you introduce uh, the subject of diversity. And, and there is something that perhaps you've not spoken to very directly, but you've mentioned, I think it is your kinsman, Chinua Achebe, who writing in 1983, the trouble with Nigeria said that the problem of Nigeria and by extension of Africa is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. And I can't agree with you more. I personally have said in a different setting that part of the African problem is that those who have power have no ideas and those who have ideas have no power. And I can't agree with you more. Uh, one cannot even quarrel with the question of the diversity that you've talked about. In fact, if you go down in history in 1963, perhaps before I come to 1963, let me go back to the Berlin Project. The arbitrary creation of what we now call countries were 
was essentially to design units that could not function. The post-colonial African state was not supposed to function, they were supposed to collapse. And that debate did preoccupy the founding leaders of Africa. And you will remember in 1963, there was the debate whether the inherited boundaries should be inviolable. The arguments were then put forth, I think, a lot more strongly at that time by Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, and Habben Bebela, and Gamal Abdel Nasser. So the doctrine of the inviolability of inherited boundaries took root. The argument they had then was that if you started redrawing boundaries, then there would be too much conflict in Africa. And for a time, of course, we were tied down and we still continue to be tied down with these artificial boundaries. Simon, you will agree with me that indeed, the reason why the Osage Kwame Nkrumah called for the immediate unification of Africa was the very same thing that is happening now. He said, if we don't unite now, and these presidents and prime ministers that are emerging in these little artificial countries begin to get used with political power and the trappings of office, then Africa will never know peace. And I can't agree with you more. This is not a forum for going deep into history, but this is something I've said elsewhere. You are typical European nation is a nation state. One cannot quarrel with that. You go to Sweden, it is the Swedish, they have a small Finnish population and they have special governance for them. You go to Finland, a Finnish population, a small Swedish population, they have a problem with them. And indeed in Europe, as you've rightly said, in countries like Spain, where you have a multiplicity of, uh, of nations, the state is divided into 17 ethnically pure nations. The same is true of Switzerland. During our own lifetime, I think you and me have seen the Soviet Union collapse along tribal lines, creating Russia, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and all these, Belarusia, and all these. The question that we must grapple with, and unfortunately, Simon, we are afraid to grapple with it. And the truth is that our fear is informed by our hypocrisy. We are hypocritical, particularly those of us who have had the advantage of what we call education, that is formal schooling. So that you would hear somebody who is a Yoruba, for example, or an Igbo, when he is at a forum where he thinks that he or she will be accused of ethnicity, saying, you Nigeria must be the way it is. I've been on record as saying that most African countries must be renegotiated for their survival. The Swiss renegotiated their country. That is how you have a very weak center in Bern. You have the French speaking, the German speaking, the Roman speaking, and the Italian speaking. Aside from Tanzania, which through the very active effort of Malimu Julius Kambara Nyerere, there is not a single African country that is grappling with the question of what you've described as negative diversity. And I can't agree with you more. Until the day that Africa begins to confront how to deal with diversity, there will be conflict after conflict in Africa. And as I conclude, I want to give you an example, if only to lend credence to your own argument. Ethiopia now. Ethiopia was being touted as a country that was beginning to realize major economic gains. As I speak to you now, the Tigre are rebelling against the government in Addis Ababa. The Amhara are also worried about the government in Addis Ababa. The Oromo are doing the same thing. Somalia is the same thing. You go to Sudan in Darfur, 
in the Nuba Mountains in Abia. You go to Southern Sudan, you and me know the problem between the Nuer and the Dinka and the others. You go to Central African Republic, you go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, you go to even countries that we don't talk about very loudly. You go to Angola, the Ovambo and the Ovimbundu. You go now to South Africa as I speak to you. The problem of the Zulu, uh, now that they want to arrest Zuma, is beginning to arise. You go to Senegal, the problem of the Casamans. You go to Cameroon, you know the problem there. In uh, Ambazonia, you come to your own country, the Odudua Republic and Biafra. And one can go on and on. And I am suggesting to you, as I conclude, that you remember 2020 was meant to be the year of silencing the guns in Africa. The guns were never silenced. And we have now declared this decade as the decade of silencing the guns. And it is important, and I can't agree with you more, Simon, that until and unless African countries are renegotiated for their sustainability, African countries are going to collapse. In Nigeria, there may be, and you can hold these artificial countries for a long time by force of arm, but wisdom demands that you renegotiate them. And I've been on record as saying that it's important for the Abuja administration to listen to what is being said by the Igbo people in Biafra, to what is being said by the Ijo, to what is being said by the Ibibio, to what is being said by the Odudua. And that is the only way in which we are going to sustain these countries. Otherwise, one day, what is going to happen to many African countries is what happens to Yugoslavia. And it is instructive that the year before Yugoslavia collapsed, what had happened is an opinion poll had been conducted and it reported that the people of Yugoslavia felt more Yugoslavia than they were Serbians or Slovenes. Within one year, the country that Tito had put together by force of arm and by ideology collapsed. And you know what happened in Yugoslavia. And as I said at the beginning, you know what happened with the Soviet Union. And you too know, even in China, which we think is homogeneous, you know the agitation of the Tibetans. You know the agitation of the Uyghurs. Even in India, the federal structures are working federal structure because Nigeria is not federal. Nigeria claims to be federal. You and me know that that is not true. There was an attempt to renegotiate Nigeria before the Civil War. And you will remember the meeting that was attended by Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuku in Aburi and the Aburi principal. Perhaps I do not know whether it's too late, but perhaps there may be wisdom in going back to Aburi and beginning to ask what it is that can be done. And these are things that I think we as Africans ought to bring on the table now, because if we do, there's going to be so many conflicts in Africa, and it will be to the joy of the arms sellers in Europe and America and progressively Asia. So, Simon, I agree with you and I understand that indeed what is happening in Africa, even when we talk about preparedness, not just for COVID, for everything, not just for COVID. Your typical scientist does not have the resources which he or she needs in order to engage in serious research. I remember two years ago I was in Vienna, Austria, and I spoke and said all Africans should try and come back home. During the question and answer session, a young girl, a doctor from Zimbabwe stood up and he, she said she agreed with me on everything except she wanted me to ask, to answer one question. Said I was a doctor in Zimbabwe. When I left, my salary was the equivalent of five United States dollars and I had not received it for six months, should I still go back to Zimbabwe? I said no. And, and my answer was informed by reality. Many a professional in Africa cannot function 
because our governments do not have the wisdom and the sense to resource them. And that is why I said that re research and development is critical. Your typical African government will use money to buy arms. And in Africa during this COVID period, there is not a single country. Perhaps there is two exceptions in this regard, Rwanda and Tanzania, where funds set aside for COVID has not been stolen. Because the African government is a hunting ground, as you rightly said. Those who get into government see it as a job. They are job seekers whose only desire is to go into government and steal and to get pensions thereafter. It is in Africa where you find politicians seeking pensions, former presidents seeking pensions, and members of parliament seeking pensions and councillors. So I hope, Simon, that this debate which you planted in our minds today will not stop here. How can we introduce diversity of a positive kind? Because it appears to me, if I hear you correctly, that sometimes in order to unite, you must disengage. And that if you are in a bad marriage to remain there simply because divorcing gives you the mark of Cain upon your forehead, you suffer eternal pain. I would want to engage you elsewhere so that this argument of negative diversity is looked at very keenly as one of the ways in which we can save the continent of Africa and make her unite. Thank you very much. May I also, may I also make, some, make some quick one? Thank you so much. Uh, that was Professor uh, Pielo Lumumba uh, Simon. You only have about three minutes. Three minutes? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Do I have three minutes? Two. All right. Two. two. Uh, doc, two doc, doc, yes. I'm hungry. Doc, they say you have to eat. So. <laughs> so, okay. So, is it now? Yeah, just now. Go, go ahead. I'm sure I'm sure you're five minutes. All right, go, go ahead, Simon. Go ahead. I should go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. I am uh, I'm the, I'm the happiest person to be. It means that we are in a, a very right direction. Remember, you are one of the respected person in Africa. And uh, so, having, uh, you know, agreed somehow, on this uh, particular uh, thought, line of thought, we are expecting you to also be in the lead. Because uh, the point is that there are people who those leaders in Africa listen to. And uh, you happen to be one of them that, uh, you know, they're listening to. Now, uh, you also uh, mentioned something about Aburi. You know, you touched a lot of things. Uh, you mentioned something about an Aburi Accord, whether it is need to visit that or something like that, maybe because of what I have said earlier. Uh, let me also put this in your mind, that the issue of Aburi, when we talk about Nigeria, the issue of Aburi is a no-go area. Because a lot, a lot of things have changed. During the time of the Aburi Accord, we do not have six terrorist groups in Nigeria. And that this terrorist group, they are coming from one particular region. We do not have that during that time. So there are so many compelling factors that will make us not to talk about a Bori Accord. A Bori Accord or anything restructuring is out of question. Of course, some people may argue that, uh, well, yes, let us restructure regionally and all that. And my question to them is, how do you restructure this terrorist group? We need to handle this issue in a way to solve the terrorists, to solve the issue of insecurity. And we say we have researched and we know how to solve it. How to solve it is to first of all, identify the reason why you have the terrorist group in Nigeria in the first place. What are the reasons? 
The reason is very simple. The terrorist group are fighting for Islamic State. What is Islamic State? Islamic State is a state where you have Sharia law. The Sharia law may be very extreme, or however, there is no difference between Islamic State and Sharia law. The Sharia law, Islamic State. Islamic State is Sharia law. Now, when you disintegrate Nigeria, automatically you have disintegrated the interest of the terrorist group that we have formed to make sure that they turn Nigeria into Islamic State. Because, as I speak to you now, the 12 northern states in Nigeria already are practicing Sharia law. And even though we have Christians in the north, the northern Nigeria will be very comfortable with their Sharia law because they are already practicing that at the moment. That will also disintegrate the interests of the terrorists who are eyeing the middle belt of Nigeria and the southern Nigeria. When that is done, when Nigeria is written to tribal line, the interest of this terrorist group already has been disintegrated 80%. How do we end this terrorism in the north? By that time, all terrorists will either lay down their arms in frustration or they continue to launch terrorist attack in other neighboring countries like the Middle Belt, Biafra, and Udugua. And what do we do? We are going to have what we call a joint military operation for a complete wiping out of terrorists in Sahel region because we are going to have compromised military. When we say compromised military, is that uncompromised military. In Nigeria today, you have compromised military. You have military who are sympathetic to the terrorists. And those who are ready to fight the terrorist group in Nigeria will never be allowed to become the chief of army staff. Even if they are allowed to become the chief of army staff, the chief of army staff does not go to one front. The people that go to one front who are sympathetic to the terrorists, so it can never work. And it can never end the war on terrorism. But disintegration of Nigeria will end the war of, to, uh, of, on terrorism. It will make us, the Afra people, or Dudua people, and however, whichever country that is going to emerge from Nigeria, uncompromised military oppression to bring Africa to a safe place. Like I said, the disintegration of Nigeria will be the beginning. Lastly, you also agree with what most of the things I've said, and I'm very happy for that. And it will be good that with this thing that you said I have planted in your minds today, we begin to discuss it. Let it begin to germinate. That sometimes you also agree that sometimes you need to, you know, to disintegrate in order to come together. And that's what we are asking for. The disintegration of Nigeria, the disintegration of those who feel oppressed, who feel they are different, and for that they are not being carried along in any government. Bringing them and making them go their way and govern themselves will strengthen the unity of Africa at the end of the day. And so submit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is two minutes African time. All right. I think we will take a break uh, right now and then we shall be back at about 2.30 and we will continue with our afternoon session. But before we do that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. David Matanga. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Today you have been asking me to find the professor. I found him. And he gave you, you gave him. You exchanged very good intellectual exchanges. And you learn more. Apparently, let me tell you, people think professor is older than Matanga. No. I am older than a professor, but only that uh, <laughs> professor is growing younger every day. He's a very good friend of mine and he does not take enemies at heart. He has never had about anything. Simon is a good student of yours. He has been following whatever you say and he wanted to put that word across. 
I want to take this opportunity now to thank all of you that our next session begins at 2.30. 2.30 East African Standard Time. And it will be moderated by Miriam, who will be now calling upon Dr. Edward Kusew, Kusewa. And then other people from Zimbabwe, there are several people, and other people from Biafra who want to speak, other people from Zambia, there is somebody who has called me from Zambia, where the funeral of President Kaunda is taking place. Uh, the funeral service and His Excellency President Uhuru Mingai Kenyatta has flown in there, he just arrived there. And the President Emerson Munagagwa, my friend, is also there. They have called uh, people from there, they, they have said they are in Zambia at the moment. It is surprising that this news of Mr. Namudikan has spread everywhere, especially Zimbabwe which first recognized Biafra together with Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. They are very concerned and the people are raising those questions at that forum. So, as we say, let's just now move out for our lunch. We come back at 2.30, Miriam takes over the session and all of us will be here. Those reporting from the Indian Ocean a coastline, do we call it a coastline? Yes. Can now move back to the eating place, otherwise you'll miss your lunch. Thank you very much. And stay tuned at 2.30 East African time, which is uh, 12.30 Nigerian time or Central African time. Thank you. God bless. must be our goal and our guide. And all that we strive for as a human family, dignity and hope, progress and prosperity, depends on peace. But peace depends on us.